I'm Alan Mortis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think Planet. With me in the studio today is Dr. Tom Fleischner. Whereas I sometimes say um, that natural history is a verb, not a noun. That natural history is about the doing. It's the, you know, and if you were going to boil that whole definition down to to the commonest uh, language you could, it would be something along the lines of that natural history is the practice of paying attention to the world we live in, mm-hmm. uh, with carefully and with intention, and and being open to what we find. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. Think Planet is made possible by support from the Western Colorado University School of Environment and Sustainability, empowering future change agents to foster ecologically resilient, economically sustainable, and socially just communities throughout the world. If you like Think Planet, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think People, a celebration of just how amazing people can be. Think Business, a weekly discussion with entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors on sustainable business into the 21st century. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. With me in the studio today is Dr. Tom Fleischner. He's an ecologist, conservation biologist, and faculty emeritus in the Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies Program at Prescott College in Prescott, Arizona. He's the executive director of the independent nonprofit Natural History Institute, an organization he helped found. Much of his work, he has said, focuses on revitalizing the practice of natural history. Over the past three decades, Dr. Flashner has worked to break down barriers to integrate art science, and humanities in in order to explore the link between a connection to nature and human wellness. He's the author of a new book with the intriguing title, Nature Love Medicine, Essays on Wildness and Wellness. Tom, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Let's start at um, the top and work (laughs) our way down. Okay. And that is with the question... What is natural history? And I ask that because a lot of people, the only time they ever hear that term is right. when they're going to the museum. That's right. That's right. In fact, right. I often ask uh, audiences I'm talking to what what comes to mind when you hear that term, and it's usually a museum, yeah. often a museum field trip when they're in sixth grade or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's the dioramas. And yes, the... exactly. Often which are dusty. <laughs> right. Um, the term actually uh, is about 2,000 years old. Um, oh. It was uh, a, a term coined by Pliny the Elder, a Roman writer and philosopher who, who wrote uh, at the same time, uh, he, he compiled a set of books called Historia Naturalis, which is, is Latin for natural history. Um, and it was the first encyclopedia ever. It was the first time there was an attempt to capture and writing everything humans knew about everything in the world, essentially. So very broad and interdisciplinary. But uh, historia in Latin, as it, in contemporary Spanish, also means story. So it was really the story of nature. Mm-hmm. And um, so anyway, as you fast forward, um, natural history was sort of the antecedent, or the, you might say the mother discipline of many, many other con- um, uh, disciplines that have sort of broken off from it, so, you know, um, ecology, geology, paleontology, um, uh, cultural anthropology, and many other things. But, um, but um, in the 20th century, it kind of got, there became a narrower and narrower view of what it meant, and it became sort of often, too often, I would say, seen as a, as a sort of narrow uh, in, in some cases, antiquated subset of biological sciences, uh, which it, it was really initially a much broader thing. So uh, there's a lot of different definitions floating out there, but but my definition, which is somewhat more expansive, is um, that natural history is a is a practice of intentional and focused attentiveness and receptivity to the more than human world, guided by honesty. And accuracy. <laughs> oh boy, you're going to have to say that again yeah. because I mean I think every single one of those words could could spawn a deep yeah, conversation. Right, right. Right. Well, and yeah, 
So, um, so seriously, give that, give, yeah, it, sure, give sure. us that again because yeah, I so, think there's it's really important that we fully yeah, understand yeah, that. Yeah, well, thanks. So, uh, a practice natural history then would be a practice of um, intentional and focused attentiveness and receptivity to the more than human world, guided by honesty and accuracy. Hmm. And so, one, so there's a number of things that could be highlighted there, and one of them is the word practice, or as I sometimes say, um, that natural history is a verb, not a noun. That natural history is about the doing. It's the, you know, and if you were going to boil that whole definition down to to the commonest uh, language you could, it would be something along the lines of that natural history is the practice of paying attention to the world we live in, mm -hmm. uh, with carefully and with intention, and and being open to what we find. And that last part about guided by honesty and accuracy is really. Um, included to, to make clear that we need to be open to what we really see and observe in the world and not be foisting our own um, desires or models or anticipations of what nature is. It's oftentimes, for example, over-romanticized that nature is all balance or this or that, which mm. doesn't always prove it to be true when one pays careful attention. It seems that that's where science fits. Absolutely. In your definition. Yeah, 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 to, yeah, be, yeah. to be honest and accurate uh, absolutely, and, and, and scrub I, I was, out the, uh, the sentimentality, so to yeah. speak. And I was partially, that, that last phrase was partially inspired by Charles Darwin, uh -huh. who once wrote that um, accuracy is the soul of natural history. Ah. Well, so why? Why do you think that is such an important Accuracy? Element? Yeah. And, and describe how that applies to what you're talking about, this practice of paying attention. Well, because it's if we if we have, for example, uh, let's just say an over romanticized view that everything in nature is beautiful and peaceful and 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 uh, you know models of 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 delicate balance between everything and you mm -hmm. know life is couldn't be more beautiful, then we're not and then we model our human societies or our conceptions of how the world works on that that can be problematic because. There's a, some truth in that, certainly, um, but it's also true that there's predation and there's parasites and mm -hmm. there's you know all this and that. And so um, there's oftentimes some real misconceptions by people who get who just have um, uh, sort of superficial or or just um, they don't bother to actually do the practice of attentiveness. They just have a sensibility about what nature is yeah. without. The practice of paying attention. Well, what comes to my mind is a documentary I once saw about a young man who decided to go live among grizzly bears in, uh. in Alaska. <laughs> and, and it didn't end well. That's a very good example. Yeah, it did not end well. Uh, of not really taking into account yeah. the actual nature of grizzly bears. Right, that's uh, right. You know, you can live beside them for a little while, but sooner or later, that's right, uh, and, and also included a sort of inflated sense of self-importance, um, which is, I think is another sort of thing that the actual practice of attentiveness and receptivity to what we really find out there can help us have uh, a better and truer sense of ourselves and our place in the world. Not that we're unimportant, but that we are, um, th that it, it, it engenders humility, um, which that particular gentleman was seemed to be lacking. Yeah, much to his uh, ultimate demise. Right. Uh, and and I find that a, a really interesting idea. And in fact, I found an article of yours online in which you you make this point that the the Earth really doesn't ask anything of us. Yeah. That it, in other words, it's not. It doesn't see us. Nature mm -hmm. does not see us as anything mm -hmm. unique or special. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do see ourselves that way sometimes. Yeah. Yes. And so it's your experience that really paying attention when you're when you're in nature. Mm -hmm. And let's be clear, that could be at the park, absolutely, uh, in, or in the downtown. middle of a big city or wherever you happen yeah. to be. Yeah. That, that doesn't mean you're you're in a wilderness area. Correct. Absolutely. But when you're really paying attention, you you lose some of that tendency toward hubris and megalomania. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's exactly right. I wonder if there's not a flip side to that, too, though, that um, by really paying attention and taking stock of the fact that, that nature is, uh, you know, red of tooth and claw, <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to, to quote the poets, 
If you go into nature, let me put it this way, if you go into nature and you come out with this utopian sort of view mm -hmm. of it, then you might look around at human culture and say, what the heck is wrong with us? <laughs> um, well, that's, that's interesting. So, so first of all, one thing I want to make clear is that um, one of the words in that definition I didn't uh, refer to is the is the word more than human, you know, the hyphenated word. Mm. And I use that. That's a, a term I borrowed from uh, a number of people, including David Abram. Um, it's there's a lot of there was a lot of consternation sometimes in environmental philosophers and so on a, a while back that how do we even talk about nature without unduly separating ourselves from it? And we didn't want to create a, uh, just a huge dichotomy like something's either human or it's nature because we are part of nature right. and we should be part of nature and and we should claim that and, and revel in that mm -hmm. um so david and others came up with this term more than human nature to to make to, to try to erase that dichotomy or make it more fuzzy and and make clear that that we are part of nature it's not there's not this separation so that um uh you know, so back to the to the phrase uh, "historia naturalis" or the story of nature. We are very much a part of that story. So back to your then question: is if if we're part of the story, we are um, we have our beautiful attributes, biologically, ecologically, psychologically, all these ways and ways that we are very very unique and can do wonderful things that no other species can. And there's things that are problematic. And so there's a lot of that can be learned about that, as you're suggesting, about the relationship between nature and various human cultures. But when we, but when we, if, if we don't take the care to attend carefully and honestly to what's around us, then we can be, we can be vastly misjudging who we really are and what our place in the world is and that would lead to many of these problems. In fact, yeah, the, the idea that, that humanity is somehow broken, if we could only just be more like our non-human neighbors. Right, right. It's the, it's the opposite problem of that we're better than everything else and so we don't have to pay attention to them. They're yeah. both inaccurate and they're both problematic. Yeah. And I mean, I would, and I would say, I mean, one interesting thing is that if, we, if, you, if you accept my sort of expansive definition that it's a practice of attentiveness, then it's fair to say that there has never been a human being on the planet without the practice of natural history. We humans, um, in a background as an evolutionary biologist, and I think it's fair to say that humans were designed by natural selection to practice natural history, to be attentive. Our eye, we have our eyes in the front, our ears in the side. We have limbs that are enable us to to taste and touch and and yeah. and move around in different ways. And our survival from the very earliest days depended on the practice. We needed to know which animals we can eat, which animals will eat us. You know, mm -hmm. which plants are good to eat, which ones will kill us. What, what the weather is. What the weather doing. is, when the fruits will come, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's really never been people without natural history. Um, it's the oldest continuous human tradition there is. And, and yet, um, I think it's true that today, if you look at the entire history of the human species, there has never been a moment when a smaller proportion of the human species practiced natural history actively. Um, in other words, you know, there, there's just never been so little natural history going on in any kind of clear or, or intentional focused way. And then you also can look at human cultures and societies, including our own, or perhaps even especially our own, and, and you look, can look at this upsurges in all sorts of social problems and various kinds of dysfunctions, you know, school shootings, massive de levels of depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and suicides and, mm -hmm. and just, you know, um, uh, various kinds of violent social behaviors. and. That is that is at unprecedented levels, 
And um, my assertion is that it's no; those two things are not unrelated, that they're in fact directly related, that the fact that people don't pay that kind of careful attention to the world around them has everything to do with the fact that we don't know how to behave properly amongst ourselves. And I think a lot of that is because of the humility that we lose when we when we don't when we only look in the human mirror you might say well that's a great way to put it because when you are just focused on mm -hmm. the creations of human culture mm -hmm. for instance wow that is so self referential yeah absolutely from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed it's it would it would be a stretch to say that that culture could do anything other than become narcissistic. You're absolutely right, and that's exactly what's been happening. I mean, I've sometimes described it as like we're we're living in a world built out of funhouse mirrors that are distorting reality, yeah. and that's yeah. all we have to look at, or all we choose to look at. Yeah. So. Well, and some of those pathologies that you mentioned mm -hmm. um, really can be found in research among other species too, right? If mm -hmm. you overpopulate, for instance, mm -hmm. a particular species in a confined space, yeah. they turn on each other. Uh, yeah. uh, all sorts yeah. of weird yeah. things start showing up. Yeah, great point. Yep. Here again, making your point, mm -hmm. then we're no different. Yeah, right. We're just exhibiting <laughs> the natural uh, right. consequences of, right. of living the way we do. Right. And one thing that's implicit in what you just said that, that you know, often gets left out of these discussions, but it's kind of like the big elephant in the room is is population levels. And mm -hmm. and when we have as a population increase to the degree that we do, um, human population that is, then many of these other things follow from that or are more likely and, and many, many types of challenges come from that, including the ones we're talking about. Right, and so this is a chain of things. Mm -hmm. um, population coming on the heels of industrialization where we mm -hmm. were able to produce more food and mm -hmm. therefore grow mm -hmm. the population mm -hmm. leads to urbanization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which leads to less mm -hmm. um, immediate mm -hmm. need and access mm -hmm. to practice natural history. Mm -hmm. So before we go from that word practice, I don't want to lose mm -hmm. the opportunity mm -hmm. to get your ideas, mm -hmm. because of what I just said, most people are now living in urban environments. 80% mm -hmm. of us in the United mm -hmm. States, 50% mm -hmm. of us worldwide. Mm -hmm. what, do, what does practicing natural history mean to those people? Yeah, well, that's a really important question, and um, it can mean all sorts of different things. I, I think it's it's um, well, there's no question that that some people live in situations where it's much more difficult and challenging access um, to ha to have access to landscapes or habitats that that are compelling and make us want to pay attention to them you might say however in any city in the world there's fascinating things to check out whether it's which plants are coming up in cracks in a sidewalk or which insects are are hopping along or or and some 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 for example really famous some of the most famous bird watching areas on the east coast of the united states are in the middle of some of the biggest cities central park is mm. a, a <laughs> is a, a famous place that's a green magnet that all the migrant birds come into yeah. Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston is another example like that but those are perhaps exceptions um, but still but there's a lot of other things there's, there's lots of um, uh, examples of, of um, for example urban garden gardening especially um, I think a great example is community gardens that are created in large cities become a community building human community building thing but mm -hmm. also a, a way for to connect with ecological community, you might say, at the same time. Right. Um, and I, I, I think, I mean, my orientation tends to be towards wild nature, but I think looking at horticultural plants and crops and, and flowers that we're growing in our flower beds outside a high-rise apartment in New York City or whatever, those are all equally important. It's engaging with life. Um, and it's 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 taking us outside of ourself, or or to use the metaphor we were using a minute ago, it's it's looking in out a win a different window instead of just looking in the mirror. And and all those things are important. But there, and there's many other examples. I was I just came here from Salt Lake City and was talking with people there about groups of young people mobilizing. Um, uh, uh, 
mobilizing people with gardening and 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 creating herbal medicines to share with people in their community and and that's a, that's a form of natural history at least natural history is sort of the the foundation of doing that and so i i don't personally buy the argument that you can't you know that it's a that it's a priv- that it's just a privileged class thing or it's an elite thing that only if you're you know living in a um some beautiful resort town that you can do it i i think those can be very nice places to practice natural history, sure. but so are many, many other areas in rural areas mm-hmm. and farms and, and, and you know, anyway, there, there's things to pay attention to everywhere. Yeah, the spider web that gets built on your, on your back patio. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the amphibians that are in your garden. And... Absolutely. I used to have students read an essay, a wonderful essay by Lauren Isley, a great writer and, and anthropologist who uh, wrote an essay called The Hidden Teacher. And it was all about exactly what you just described, a, a spider web that he found and a, a spider that he unexpectedly encountered and bothered to, to stop and pay attention to. Mm-hmm. And all that he learned from that and Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I think there's hidden teachers out there for all of us we just came back from visiting family in Houston and Mm -hmm. and in my mother's backyard she has developed an amazing nursery for monarch oh wonderful caterpillars and she she collects them and puts them under a net to protect them from the the predators and so forth uh, in Houston that's, right. This yeah, is a great example of what we're talking about. Absolutely, and and doing important conservation work along the way because that species is threatened right now. So. Right, and I think that story could be um, repeated all over the country, wherever absolutely. you are. There's something that needs safeguarding. Absolutely, and and each time you choose to do that, you're choosing whether consciously or not, to take your psyche outside of yourself and ex- extend it into the larger world. And when we do that, we, when we connect, um, we become more whole. Mm. In fact, the, the, I, working on this, this book that you mentioned, I uh, uh, realized that the words whole, whole with a W, and heal come from the same, um, the same roots. And so mm. for several hundred years, mm. Our language, even if not our conscious minds, has recognized that wholeness and healing come from the same source. Which, by extension, suggests that fragmentation of any kind Mm -hmm. leads to disease and dysfunction. Yeah. In introducing you, I mentioned that you've really worked to integrate mm-hmm. other disciplines into mm-hmm. this conversation. For yeah. you, it's it stopped being just about ecology yeah. or conservation biology, yeah, yeah. Um, but included the arts mm-hmm. and the humanities, creative writing mm-hmm. and so forth. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, partly just because on an individual level, that's kind of what turns me on. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But, but, um, but also because um, perhaps more strategically, um, I mean, I'm, I'm by nature a, one who tries to bring things together and tries to make connections. And that's uh, some people are very, very good about burrowing into the smallest mm-hmm. uh, you know details of a particular organism or whatever. and I and that's incredibly important and and I respect that greatly. I've never been that person. i'm I'm much more interest always been much more interested in finding connections between a lot of different things and mm-hmm. i've I've always been drawn to the arts as well as to the sciences. and um, so that's partly just my my psychological makeup, but it's also uh, a very conscious strategic choice in a way because the fact is, well, there's increasing literature from psychologists, sociologists, and so on that that if we want to save the world, and, and I'll be explicit that my work promoting natural history does have the intention of saving the world, and mm-hmm. I think it's an essential component mm-hmm. of saving ourselves, but... Um, that we that that he, that our behavior is is we change our behavior because of what we feel more than because of what we know, mm-hmm. and so uh, having been in the world of sciences for a long time, I I know that many scientists feel, have felt that their job is to is to figure stuff out and to provide the information that's other people's job to then take care of that whether it's you know whatever but I that's that's uh, that's never been my personal way and it's also I don't think um, effective 
Um, we, we, and, and climate change, which you mentioned a few minutes ago, is a classic example. I mean, how many stories have each of us seen and how many magazines or newspapers or whatever about, you know, worse and worse news about climate change. But, but, but that doesn't change our behavior for most of us. And, and, but what we feel about something is what, is what kind of breaks through and touches us in the heart. And, and the arts and, and the humanities, literature, storytelling, those are the things that tend to do it. And, and that comes back, you know, storytelling. I said, you know, and I said that natural history is really the, the classic original definition is the story of nature. And so that's an interesting term because if, if as any naturalist knows, if you go out in any spot, in, in any square meter of ground, you can find many stories. And so we always are going to be making choices about what we pay attention to, which stories we share. But as scientists, we haven't always been real effective uh, in which <laughs> stories we share and especially in how we share them. I think that's something of an understatement. Tom. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, uh, and, and and if I may, I think it that's almost on purpose. It, it's not that scientists really just um, aren't very good storytellers. It's that the culture of of academia, academia, and professional science discourages emotive <laughs> storytelling. Right. Well, you're absolutely right. And and it wasn't always so, um, but it has definitely become more and more that way. Um, in fact, um, that's you. You mentioned the book um, "Nature, Love, Medicine," and it was a very intentional choice to to use that somewhat provocative word "love" as part of the title. Mm, yeah. And because uh, part of what I'm trying to do is get put out on the table the notion that 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 love of the world is not something we should be shy about. It's something we should be <laughs> actively cultivating, and it's what the world needs, mm. and it's what we need ourselves. And science, professional academic scientists are probably the most frightened of that because, and it's all about, as you say, uh, worrying about loss of credibility, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. And and some of that comes down to, well, it, it comes down to a lot of different things, but but it it, it was not always this way. If, if you look at the at the professional literature, in a journal such as Ecology, which is the standard, you know, the biggest journal of ecological science in the world, mm -hmm. the nature of the papers in that journal and any other one that we could choose have changed dramatically um, in the last few decades. And it's wonderful. What's there now is very useful, but it doesn't communicate. It doesn't even c communicate intellectually to the masses of people, let alone to touching us in the hearts. And so I think that, that scientists have a responsibility, actually, to reach out beyond that. And there's many people that are doing wonderful jobs of that in lots of creative ways. But So this is kind of my little effort. And do you see any reason for hope that that pendulum is starting to shift back toward a more integrated and I do. holistic way of looking at <clears throat> I do, actually. Yeah, which is wonderful to be able to say. Yeah. Um, well, give us an example. Well, for example... Um, I just mentioned the journal Ecology that's published by the the, the largest professional society of uh, ecologists in the world, the Ecological Society of America. And a few years back, uh, well, in the earlier days when people like Aldo Leopold and so on were involved, they were very integrative and and you know writing very persuasive mm -hmm. kinds of essays and so passionate. on. Passionate, <laughs> yeah, passionate and. And then it, that became less and less so. And um, so a few years back, um, a colleague and I put together um, a symposium uh, and proposed it to the Ecological Society of America for the annual conference and were told that um, it was rejected as a symposium. And we were, even though we had a, a lineup of wonderful, some quite well-known speakers and so on, because they said a natural history is no longer, I guess I don't think I said that the symposium was about why natural history matters in ecology. Mm -hmm. and they said natural history is no longer the cutting edge of ecology. And we're thinking, well, that attitude is part of the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's but, why we want to have a symposium. Let's talk about that. Right. So we, so they, they have this sort of downgraded version of a symposium that's not called a symposium, but it basically is one. So we did it. And it was like standing room only. Mm. And people, it was like the buzz of the conference. And people came running down the aisle saying, you know, this is why I became an ecologist 30 years ago. Nobody's ever talked about it since. 
And um, that's not to say there's not still a lot of ecological scientists that would still say that's not the cutting edge of ecology. <laughs> right, right. But it's, um, I don't even know if it is the cutting edge of eco ecology. It's just the essential foundation of ecology. Yeah, and, and uh, needs to be included yeah, in the conversation yeah, yeah, at least. Yeah, yeah. And it's what, it, it is what touches the hearts and minds of people. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of focus on trying to... Um, to reach out in ecology and in conservation and just in environmental groups in general to lots of different kinds of populations, and, and um, which is a wonderful focus, an important focus. And I think natural history is part of the way to do that because the, the stories about, hey, check this out, look at, have you ever seen that? Yeah, the eyes, somebody I, I was with last night was talking about the ocelli of a dragonfly and he was blown away by you know, that, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever it is, that's what captures people, not something, you know, theoretical construct. Sure. And, and, and if you go on YouTube, for instance, mm -hmm. a lot of the videos that are being passed around by people who would not even know what natural history right. is. Right. Are those very, very things. That's right. Cool little uh, yeah. tidbits about yeah, the natural world that somebody finds. Absolutely. And, you know, you and I are, are talking just a week after the International Panel on Climate Change yeah. released its most recent mm -hmm. report from South Korea, mm -hmm. um, suggesting that mm, estimates from even just a decade ago are turning mm -hmm. out to be mm -hmm. uh, understated. Yeah, which and, has been the case at every step. <laughs> every step of the way, right? Yeah. That, that's yeah. nothing new. But one thing that did strike me about this report is the idea that if we're going to hold warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, mm -hmm. for instance, then it's going to take everyone's involvement. Mm -hmm. This is not about policymakers. Yeah. Uh, we're past the point where just trading carbon credits is going to get it done, that right. everybody has to participate. Would you say that that right there is rationale for making certain that scientists are telling stories that appeal to the people just living their lives, trying to make the mortgage. In a word, yes. <laughs> and that's a great that's a great connection to make. And and I think that is a great um, example and obviously an incredibly sobering one. Um, because in every at every step of this particular um, calamitous pathway, um, the scientists have been meticulous and and extremely careful not to overstate the risks. And so at every level, the, what they have predicted very carefully has turned out to be an understatement. Mm -hmm. And at every step of response, the human response has to, is to do as little as possible, mm -hmm. often amounting to virtually nothing. And of course, in our country right now, there's, there's, if anything, a movement backwards or a leap backwards, mm -hmm. which is extremely distressing. So, certainly so yeah, at so, the policy level, I'm not certain that that's true at the individual level. No, I'd say it's not, and that's a good point. But um, uh, so, that's all to say. Back to your question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes. Things that things that touch our hearts and that 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 that. Um, that move us and that we feel in an emotional sense are what um, are what are needed to to, to get us engaged. Mm -hmm. And I and uh, you know you asked about hope, and I would say part of my hope is seeing a lot of people in the scientific community more and more um, coming on board with that. Because um, while well, they say you know it's the it's the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. <laughs> and I think right. I think um, a lot of uh, scientific thinkers are it, it become becomes it starts to feel that way in a way like we're just telling more information more data more data and then nothing's happening and so maybe something different needs to happen well we need to understand as you've suggested that data is not a story a right. story right. Yeah. is by its very right. definition right. emotive and right. it takes us to a place that makes us feel right and that's what you have attempted to do in this book, Nature, Love, Medicine, Essays on Wildness and Wellness. Um, Tom, thanks for joining me, and thanks, yeah. for, uh, thanks. for leading the charge in bringing, <laughs> bringing story back to natural history. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching. 
Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Planet.